Today is the day that Crystal Mason, a 43-year-old black woman in Texas, begins a five-year sentence in prison for voting while black and a convicted felon. She did not know that as a felon she could not vote. She thought it was her civic duty. She was so inspired by Hillary Clinton running for president that she showed up to vote. Her name was not on the rolls because she was a felon. She, her name had been purged from the rolls. And so she cast a provisional ballot, which was never counted. Nonetheless, the, the Republican leadership of the state of Texas has decided to put her in prison for five years by way of saying to black people broadly and anybody who's ever had any problem with the law, because most people don't know, hey, was that speeding ticket a felony or was it a misdemeanor? Was, you know, what, where, do I, can I vote or not? This is another Republican voter suppression effort. And, in, uh, and then the story of Alba Lorena Rodriguez. She was five months pregnant in December of 2009 when she fainted. She was having horrible pains in her stomach. She was pregnant. She was five months pregnant. She, she miscarried. And she, did, she held a wake for the child who she miscarried, for the fetus that she lost. She was in mourning. And the police showed up and put her in prison. She is now in the eighth year of her 30-year sentence for illegally having an abortion. This is, this is in El Salvador where abortion is illegal. This is where Brett Kavanaugh wants to take us. And it is insane. Shane Bauer is on the line with us. Shane is uh, an investigative journalist, senior writer with Mother Jones, author of the new book, American Prison. Uh, he's, uh, he, he's been on our program before. Shane Bauer, B-A-U-E-R dot net is the website. You can tweet him at Shane underscore Bauer. And uh, Shane, brilliant book. Welcome back to the program, first of all. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, A, you were in, put in prison in Iran for, for inadvertently crossing the border, but then you came back to the United States and you got a job as a prisoner in a private prison, kind of went underground, and that, I believe, is the essence of this book, of, of the horrors of the private prison system. And uh, tell us about it. Yeah, um, I got out of prison myself in 2011, came back to the U.S., uh, and uh, assumed I would go back to the Middle East uh, to do, you know, which is where I was working as a reporter, but uh, kind of got pulled into the uh, U.S. prison system, uh, where we have 25% of the world's prison population, um, and spent a few years uh, writing about prisons and, and criminal justice in the U.S., and was constantly frustrated by the the difficulty in getting access to prisons here. Uh, and I was interested in uh, corporate run prisons. Um, and, you know, we had a very, had very kind of little sense of what life was like inside of these places because they're very good at uh, keeping journalists out. Uh, so, you know, I applied um, on, on the corporate website for a job uh, I didn't honestly think it was going to work, uh, partially because I filled out the application truthfully, uh, including my current employer and my job history. Uh, but within a couple of weeks, I was getting phone calls and uh, was doing job interviews and had multiple offers for jobs in prisons around the country. Wow. Wow. The, your new book is, by the way, titled American Prison. Um, did, did I catch this? Uh, yeah, I, I have not. We, we just got the book yesterday afternoon. I have not had an opportunity to read it. Um, but I did read some of the material that came along with it, that the whole idea of private prisons goes back to ancient Rome, but was a big deal in the southern states uh, during, during and after Reconstruction? Uh, private prisons actually started here in the U.S. Um, uh -huh. okay. In fact, the, the penitentiaries themselves started in the U.S. Um, we've had jails since the yeah, early civilization uh, where people would be held before going to, to trial. But uh, the idea of, of the, the imprisonment itself being punishment started here in this country. And really the first penitentiaries uh, were, were intended uh, to make a profit. And uh, through, through the use of prison labor, prison labor was uh, contracted uh, to private contractors um, in the Northeast. And then in the South, when uh, the South opened penitentiaries, they were uh, used, they were essentially uh, factories, um, and they were 
used to produce uh, clothing uh, that was sold at a discount to planters to use uh, for, for slaves. So it's kind of a subsidy to the, the slavery system. Uh, but after the Civil War, uh, the prison system throughout the South uh, was entirely privatized. Um, companies would put their prisoners on plantations or in, in labor camps and uh, force them to work. Uh, essentially, was uh, re- they were replacing the role of, of slaves. Um, and this this went on for decades. And this system uh, known as convict leasing was was actually more deadly than slavery. Uh, the, the death rates, the annual death rates throughout the South ranged from 16 to 25 percent, a quarter of the prisoners dying every year in some states. Um, and, you know, eventually, uh, well, states at this time, I should say, were it wasn't just the companies were making a lot of money. The states also were. Uh, Alabama was was making uh, 10 percent of its budget at one point through uh, leasing of prisoners. So, States were very hooked on this kind of uh, system, but eventually they essentially cut out the middleman, uh, bought plantations of their own, put prisoners to work on these plantations uh, where, you know, they would be uh, whipped and tortured from not meeting uh, quotas. And the, all of the money would go into state treasuries. And uh, it was really in this system that the founder of the Corrections Corporation of America, which ran the prison I went undercover in, uh, started his career. Uh, hmm. Terrell Don Hutto ran uh, a plantation prison in Texas in, starting in 1967, where inmates were forced to pick cotton on a plantation the size of Manhattan. He lived on the plantation with his family. They had uh, what were called houseboys that uh, served him and his family. Uh, he went on to run plantation prisons in Arkansas at a profit to the state. And eventually he was approached by uh, couple of businessmen who, you know, uh, noticed him uh, for his ability to run uh, prisons um, at a profit. And they proposed the idea to him that they start a a corporation called the Corrections Corporation of America that would be uh, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And what has happened since then? Uh, Well, now the the company is a $1.4 billion company. Uh, The the private prison industry in general is about a four. $4 $4 billion industry. Uh, it runs prisons all over the country. Uh, it, the private prison industry controls about 8% of the national prison population and two thirds of uh, immigrant detention centers. Um, the uh, immigrant detention is kind of uh, their growth area uh, right now. Shane, is there, we have about a minute left, is there any effort by anybody to push back on this to change the, the dynamic of this? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's big divestment campaigns. Uh, The federal government, even at the end of the Obama administration, uh, announced that they would stop using private prisons. Uh, That uh, was, of course, changed uh, by the Trump administration. Uh, But there there have been significant pushes to end uh, private prisons. And I think uh, that is, uh, you know, not a controversial position at this point. Yeah. It it seems like something we should definitely be paying attention to. Shane Bauer, his new book, American Prison, and uh, the subtitle, A Reporter's Undercover Journey into the Business of Punishment. Shane, thanks for dropping by today. Thank you. Great talking with you, and and you know, good luck with the book. I hope it I hope it goes far and wide. It's a it's a marvelous piece of writing.